Uh, when I meet an attorney and give them a chance, I meet them and tell them that I'm unapologetically high maintenance. <laughs> and, um, and I'm going to tell you how I want you to write your letters. I'm not telling you what I want in your letters. I'm going to tell you how to write your letters. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Defense of Arrest. I am Megan, and I'm joined here with Melissa. Hey, Melissa. Hello. How are you doing today? Doing great. The kids are back to school. My house is Ooh. quiet. It feels very lonely, but... The most wonderful time of the year for parents, though. So. <laughs> it is. Although, it's funny, like, the first day, you know, they get on the bus, I came in the house, and I cried. Aww. <laughs> really? Your kids are old, right? Not old, but old. They're not like babies. No, they're not babies, but yeah, you just still like it. It's like there's a lot of emotion on the first day. Okay, and, okay. You know, um, yeah. but then it's like quiet, and then you're like, oh, the chaos is gone. Like the right now, chaos. you remember. Yep, yep. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, and they ha- they have a great start, and they're all happy to see their friends, and they're excited to be back in school. They're not at that I hate school stage yet, so it's still a, right. You know, it's excitement. It's fun. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. good luck to them. I hope they have a really great year. Yeah, me too. I, I'm not happy about the return of homework and like real bedtimes and all that. And then right. and they started this thing that they like do their hair more now. Like they like to blow dry it. And that's like, okay, a whole new addition. now there's more time in the morning to get ready and at night and yes, the whole yeah. thing. You get ready yeah. for teenagers and you have two girls. So I, know. I, was, ready. Blow drying, I was blow drying hair at 730. <laughs> I'm like, this was not what I was planning to do this morning at 730. I was, this is my time to like I don't know. Drink my. We'll dry your own hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I take. Anyway, <laughs> right. So today we have on Susie Braden, who is the uh, directors of comp claims, workers' compensation claims at Compass Health, and you know i have Melissa. You you're the one who found Susie, and I, I yeah. I'm excited to have her on to you know just just to talk about what you know what's she sees stuff all over the United States. Yes. Yes, she handles comp claims in, like you said, all over the country, and she has to sort of learn the different procedures and rules and find a way to work with her counsel all over the country to sort of get these claims handled, and it's fascinating, so I can't wait to talk to her. Yeah, well, let's do it. Let's bring her in. Good afternoon, Susie. Welcome to the Defense of Arrest. How are you today? Great. I want to thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to talk about my favorite items. <laughs> well, <laughs> Insurance. <laughs> I'm happy to have you to talk about insurance and all, and and hopefully we'll find out some other favorite items we don't know about already that aren't connected to insurance. That's where I, those are my favorite discussions to have on this podcast. The things that have nothing to do with um, what any of us do or any, like it has to do with legal or claims. We get off track. I love those conversations. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) But before we do that, before we get off track, let's get on track. So um, so Susie, you are the directors of worker, workers' compensation claims at Encompass Health, but that's where you are now. You know, everyone in, in claims and in, in the legal world, we all have kind of gotten to where we are in a, in a very different path. So, you know, did you go to school like thinking that you were going to end up in something insurance or how did you fall into this field? Nobody goes into workers' comp straight out of before college. Oh, I can't wait to deal with workers' comp. Um, Every yeah. little girl's dream growing up. <laughs> um, so, I want to be a singer <laughs> and manage comp claims. <laughs> I want to be a runway model and manage workers' comp claims. <laughs> it's much well, more lucrative than being a model, I'm sure. Um, well, it depends on if you look like a child or not, (laughs) (laughs) or a stick, stick pole. And I'm not that person. Um, it's almost like my singing abilities. I don't have any, um, you pay me. I sing solo, solo. You can't hear me. You need to pay me not to sing. (laughs) But anyway, no, I graduated from college. Um, I have a degree in social work. I was doing a social work job and decided that just wasn't for me. Started working as a temp at a local company, our local natural gas utility in their HR department. And that person did risk, did workers' comp and risk management. And I guess I got suckered in and never left. They say <laughs> when you, you can't leave. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> what did you like about it at the time? Like when you first started out, what was it that kept you there? Um, it's the same thing that keeps me here. Every day yeah. it's something new. It's always a new challenge. 
no claim is the same. Even if you have two knee injuries, you know, you've got a 35 year old and a 70 year old, honestly, there's nothing about those claims the same. And I've always dealt in multiple jurisdictions. So how it works in Alabama is not how it works in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. So it's the diversity of claims, diversity of state laws. And honestly, I love working with people. So I spend a lot of my time throughout my career coaching and training and teaching my HR people or my plant managers or my hospital store directors and employees too. I mean, I, when I first started, I worked with our union. I finally got on the good side of the union. And so they would come and ask me questions. So I think that's why. Yeah. I mean, I think this industry in general, you have to be generally okay with people because we all have to deal with, you know, like, I mean, Melissa and I can't do our, if we, if we didn't like dealing with people, we were probably in the wrong profession. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Especially if you don't, and if you only want to deal with nice people, we're in the wrong profession too. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I could be that person. <laughs> so have you, you always been involved in, um, or how did you get, make the transition to being involved in like a health organization? Well, I, Birmingham's a pretty small risk management community. We don't have a lot of large employers. So it was just kind of, I've hopped around honestly from one large employer to another large employer. So I worked at Alagasco, which was also energy, which was a, a national uh, gas exploration company. Then Health South was hiring. So I went to Health South, which is kind of, is where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. But then they ended up selling their hospital, uh, selling off their surgery divisions. So I went with that one. And then I left there and went to Regions Bank, which is a regional bank that's in 14 states. And then I left to go be the risk manager for a local grocery store chain that had 54 grocery stores. Mm-hmm. And then when they closed about a year later, my boss called me and said, hey, you want to come back to doing claims? So I <laughs> back up here. At that time, it's Health South, but we, we uh, rebranded in 2018 to Encompass Health. Going from, you know, working at, or doing or working workers comp claims at like a, a a food grocery versus a healthcare facility like what you must be seeing totally different types of claims uh you'd be surprised there are, like in grocery store you see a lot of back claims mm-hmm. in transportation right. business, we see a lot of back claims um in the gas utility we saw a lot of back claims as well because of they're doing the jack hammering and digging holes yeah. and check reading gas lines i mean we had some we had a variety of claims at the gas company so um, the claims that you see vary, um, right. the process is the same. That's, that's the interesting piece. Yeah. It's learning the nuances. Like one of the things that's different about doing claims in a healthcare environment is some of the people know healthcare. So you don't necessarily have the people that don't know, but that also has its pros and cons because some of them think they can fix themselves or they want to argue with the doctor Or the doctor gives them professional courtesy, which is nice sometimes, and sometimes it's a disadvantage to trying to manage the claim. Right. And so I know you've mentioned this, Encompass is all over the country. So you're dealing with workers' comp claims in all all different states, which have all different rules. Now, I I practice comp in New York and New Jersey, which is enough to sort of um, make heads or tails of in and of itself. So (laughs) how in the world do you oversee claims with different rules and with the understanding that I'm sure you have counsel and a a team to help, but how in the world do you do that? Um, It's my superpower. (laughs) It is, apparently. Um, Okay, honestly, I rely very heavily on my adjusters at my third party administrator. Um, At the current time, that is Corvell Corporation. Um, But after you do claims in a certain state for so long, like I've been doing claims in Florida since 2006, you kind of start to learn it. Like I've done, I've been exposed to Alabama claims, although one of the guys on my team handles Alabama, but I've been exposed to Alabama for 23 years now. So I kind of get to know it. So that's one reason um, I make sure that my team is assigned to a state and we just hope we have enough hospitals in a state that you get to learn the state. Like, for right. example, we have one hospital in Oklahoma or one hospital in Utah. It's hard to get to know mm-hmm. when you're in 35 yeah. states, you have one hospital in a state. But like in New Jersey, I have um, three, three hospitals, but they produce a lot of claims. Right. In, in Texas, I have 28 hospitals. 
So it's a little easier to get used to those states when you have enough amount of claims in there to talk about. And over my career, I've had some really good adjusters and attorneys that I've partnered with who's been willing to take the time and explain that to me or explain to me why this claim is different than that claim. So while we're having to go this route with this claim and that route with this claim, it makes a huge difference. Are there any states that are, are, like, are kind of like weird workers' comp laws? Not weird, but different maybe than some of the other because you know a lot of times the, the the way the comp claims are handled in court you know it's similar they're similar they have different rules and in different time limits of course but generally it's like you know it's the same thing any states have any like funky rules in terms of comp okay here's what i'll tell you is weird i mean for the people that are listening that are attorneys will understand this you know you have the rule of civil procedure well, in workers' comp, that's not the way it works in every state. <laughs> right. So, so you're playing in a different sandbox in every state. Like today, I didn't know that y'all don't take depositions in New Jersey. Learned right. that today. Um, most of my states, we do depositions to understand what's going on with the medical treatment, where the doctor's mindset is. Some states, we get to look at major contributing causes, our injury, the reason we owe all this. So stuff like that is where I think you find the weirdness. Where it gets complicated is every state has a different rule about who controls medical. So like right. in, in Virginia, Tennessee, and Georgia, you have to give them a panel. Massachusetts can go wherever they want. Florida, Alabama, I can direct care. So, I mean, that's where your nuances start coming in. Um, of course, you have your state waiting period. That's different for every state. Aver- most states are seven, but you can't say that as a general rule. Right. I think that's where you find some of that weirdness being is where you dig into the court system. And so like Alabama is still in civil court. Very few st- I think there's one other state in the nation that's still in civil court. Most right. have created their own. Conference. Their own division. Yeah. Right, right, right. And so then you have to figure out what rules you're playing by in that division. So like some states you file petitions, some states you don't. Right. Are there any jurisdictions that in your mind are, are your hell holes? Because <laughs> um, we know that for, from, you know, can I say that? I just did. I don't know. <laughs> Megan said it. You didn't. <laughs> How about, are there any jurisdictions that give you migraine headaches? <laughs> Probably the ones that we have less control of medical in. Mm-hmm. And, and I think because it's not that as the employer, I think we should have 100% control of medical, but when they when we can't control medicals we're kind of along for the ride and so the when they have control of medicals we can't talk to the doctor we can't seem to get to a common ground the goal of workers comp should be workers recovery um i don't know if you guys are familiar with bob wilson that's one of his favorite um soapboxes if you will yeah um because the whole point is to get the employee to get hurt at work hope and get them back to work we want to make things right along the way which is likely what they want to do too right that's sort of like a joint goal and and maybe when you have both minds like that it'll it'll be effective right but in a state where you can't talk to the doctor and go hey where is this going or you know can you tell me what the treatment plan is or can you tell me how we went and this happens to us quite a bit and I don't blame it on any one jurisdiction. It's medicine. But somebody has a neck or shoulder injury, and then we're now dealing with the other one. So they start out, maybe we think it's a neck injury, and it turns out to be a shoulder injury or vice versa. And you don't know how you got there. And some of the doctors aren't great about giving you that insight if you can't control medical. A lot of times, if we can control the medical, we can call the doctor and go, hey, what's going on? Help us understand. And one thing, too, I've noticed is, you know, I always wanted to look at abilities that people have instead of what their disability is. So what it is, can you do? And so sometimes doctors will write, hey, they can do 10 pounds. Well, I have this task, it may be 15 pounds. Is five pounds enough to break the camel's back or is five pounds something that you would consider or if you could get her to work up in physical therapy? You know, trying to have that work with this doctor relationship. And that's crucial. Um, I really am strong in believing in the doctor relationship. Not that I'm trying to go around the patient, but again, we're talking about workers recovery. And at the end of the day, the best thing for the employee is to be able to get hundred percent of their wages. 
And so if they're sitting at home, they're not getting 100% of their wages. And I can tell you, a physical therapist does not want the max comp rate in most states because because they're still taking a major pay cut. Right. So if we're looking at what's best for the employee and their family to get their paycheck, full paycheck, work with me. Right. But as I'm sure you you encounter, there are some individuals that despite all that, they don't want to go back to work. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, we talk about those those people. They're like the 1%, you know, they're kind of hard to find. (laughs) It takes you a long time to figure out if it's them or if it's the medical treatment, you know, um, I, I want to believe that most people are good and most people want to do the right thing. When you have someone who you suspect might not be doing the right thing, um, how do you address that? How do you handle trying to get to the truth about what's going on? Yeah. That's usually where you guys come in. <laughs> <laughs> I usually start, we start trying to put the pieces together and utilize that state law to figure out how can we reevaluate this case from a different perspective to see if what's going on is what we think is going on or not going on. Um, like in some states, Massachusetts specifically, we might use an IME to set, go, to, go to another doctor and say, hey, do a medical records review, do um, a physical exam, give us your opinion. Um, and then we have to be able to take that report back to her doctor and send it to him saying, hey, this is what they said. Do you agree, disagree, or are you willing to do it? So like a couple of times the doctors have recommended you know, different injections or recommended work hardening or that kind of stuff to try to move the person down the path of recovery. So usually where I see us kind of going that route is when we feel like somebody's kind of plateaued in medical treatment. Have you um, sort of honed in on any techniques that have helped you um, in terms of investigation, such as like surveillance, um, social media um, surveillances and reports, like have you have you found those things helpful for you? I have. I, social media can be a key. I you would be surprised, especially now with TikTok. TikTok is now. The oh thing. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and it's funny. My husband made fun of it for so long, and now he's addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I'm yeah, the same. I was like, what is TikTok? I don't care about this. Like, this is stupid. And now I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. And, and I, I remember you, Melissa and I had a conversation about TikTok. She's like, I'm not really on it. And then <laughs> yeah, it got, it sucks you in. I'm a clean talk. All the, I just watch oh. people cleaning their houses. It's so stupid. I love it. Sorry. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> but I am curious because I, I guess it's like, are, are you finding claimants, you know, doing the dances and like that sort of, I mean, everyone, people do all sorts of things on TikTok, but I imagine the most common thing is the dancing. Um, well, you know, surveillance is only a search for the truth. If you tell me you can't, I should see that you can't. And so again, I can spend all the money in the world. Let's just say five or six, 15, $20,000 on surveillance. But if it never shows you violate new restrictions, it's really dummy, no good. Right. So depending on what they're doing in their dances, if it's helpful or, helpful or not, but yes, that's what I have seen. Yes. Yeah. Um, what you find too is people don't realize what other people tag them in, which then makes it public. Right. Yes. Um, we do use surveillance again because of the cost. It's got to make sense, and I mean, yeah. and again, we're talking about the one percent. And yeah. you know, when you talk about the number of, I mean, we have what, 151 hospitals now? 1% is such a minor percentage of our claims. Yeah. yeah. Surveillance is hard because it is something that you can get that those 1% of gems, like just really good information. But a lot of times you get, you don't even get sight, you get nothing. You're like, oh, you know, the, so it can be a crapshoot a little bit, but you have to use them in, in the right in the right situation. Well, then you have to hope that when you get it, a judge will review it. Because we have yeah. one judge in Massachusetts that doesn't do surveillance. He won't. Well, really? It. Why is that? That's so interesting. Um, is it just his rule? It, it's his mindset, I think. Um, you know, we're back to that whole it was a good day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if a lot of people come in there thinking everything's a smoking gun, which is hard. I mean, yeah. we all want one. Yeah. Um, but it's not often that you get that. Um, 
again, you want to make sure if you're going to play that card in front of a judge that you got that, you've got good enough back. Right. Just one yeah. day and not just one incident. Right. So that's the other thing is you want to make sure that it's good enough to, to get you there, to push you across yeah. the finish line, to justify spending that kind of money. Yeah. Um, and nothing personal, ladies, but um, a lot of times attorneys, that's when they're always their recommendation to me. Let's do some surveillance. And I'm like, hold on. If I want to spend $4,000 on surveillance, what do we think we're going to get? Right. Um, you know, and sometimes you, sometimes you just want it for a gut check. Like this one just doesn't feel right. Yeah. I want to see. And I've done that. And, you know, I felt better. Like, all right, we'll keep writing that check and we'll keep trying to find the doctors and, you know. But if I really want it to be what, what it's, what they say it is, but yeah, I try yeah. not to spend money on those yeah. surveillance gut checks. That's yes. what's great about social media. It's free, yeah. That's you know? And so, yeah. Yeah. But you have to be careful. Not every state law is the same on, admit, on admitting it. That's true too. It's like, you find these good things and then they, they, they throw it down the toilet. It, it's so, <laughs> it's so aggravating, <laughs> but we, ha- I had a case on speaking of TikTok where, there were, it was a, a worker and she had, you know, she was claiming pretty bad neck and back injuries. And um, one of our assistants found her TikTok, which was public. And on the TikTok, it showed her doing like all of the dance challenges, flipping over, like um, standing on the couch, bending over, like, all like the whatever dance crazes they do, but just really contradicted what she was was saying and what she yeah. was alleging and her limitations. And and in that instance, social media was really helpful because we got an insight into this person's life that we never would have known, never would have seen this. And like in that instance, it kind of was a smoking gun. But like you said, that's rare. You know, I, I think people have wisened up to a little bit in terms of what they put on online and what they post. Um, but but it, public or private? Exactly. So yeah, we have to use it while we can, I think, at this well, point. And two, uh, I think a lot of the plaintiff counsel too, since they hire an attorney, I think they start talking to them about those kind of things. Yeah, oh, for that's sure. True. Yeah, I think they they got they they got smart because we I think we kept finding you know you could they kept getting found out by things and you know because yeah I mean people I I remember years ago I I had a plaintiff that was just put the dumbest things online and like I don't know his attorney wasn't telling him what not to do and it was just like it, it was like a treasure chest <laughs> bad information <laughs> yes. or, or great information for us but I was like I don't know I'm not letting this counsel know how dumb this guy's acting this is gold <laughs> exactly um, well, and so there's some attorneys or some of the states and I know one particular one there is an underground plaintiff network Yes. So where they share what they're learning with their yeah. peers. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. That comes up a lot. Um, I feel like I talk to a lot of people that the, the exchange of information amongst the plaintiffs bar um, is so strong. And there's a discussion like, why doesn't the defense bar do it? And I think a lot of it has to do with a feeling of competition um, is yeah. why such a, so much information isn't shared. Whereas in the plaintiff's bar, I, I don't think they have that mentality, but it would be helpful if we were more open about sharing things. Absolutely. I, I hadn't thought about it like that on the defense side. I guess I just assumed that that happened, but you're probably right. I mean, there is, a, I think there's a some sharing of information amongst like when, you know, bar associations or defense bar associations, but it's nothing I think like the network that the plaintiff's bar has. I just, I don't, and I don't know if we'd ever even be able to compete with it at this point, but something needs to happen. Well, yeah. I think that it might be too that, you know, as, as a defense attorney, your clients are the carriers and the carriers have such strict guidelines and rules. So sometimes I think it's hard not necessarily just like information, you know, that could ha- is universal, but maybe like strategy, things like that. It might be harder to sort of like share tips and information versus plaintiff's counsel where, you know, they're, they're running, the, the attorney's running the show essentially. I mean, their client is, has final say, but generally it's a little different. So I, I wonder if that's sort of part of it. Yeah. I don't know. So, you know, so, you know, Susan, you've been, you know, you've been in this workers' comp world for, you know, quite some time. And in your eyes, what, you know, what have you seen evolve the most in, in that time? That's like something that, you, you know, maybe it used to be just 
commonplace and now like it's not even something you see anymore or developments of new areas of claims? Um, well, one thing that always seems to come and go is CRPS or RSD. Are you ladies familiar with that? Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it goes in cycles. So you won't hear about it for a while. And then it, then you have like four or five cases of it. And yep. so then it comes back through, which is frustrating because you find that people will tell you it doesn't exist. But yeah, there's clearly something wrong with the person. Right, right. I have one case, like you look at her arm and something's not right. You can see like the discoloration or the temperature change. Oh, one of the doctors wrote in the medical records, it was flaccid. Wow. Yeah. So something's not right. But the treatment protocol for it is so different. And it's so hard um, to kind of move that person towards recovery. That's one of those um, life altering injuries that breaks your heart for the person. Um, but yeah, that's one that seems to come and go throughout my entire career. Um, I think we see therapy being used more now, but I think there's studies out there coming out talking about how a attacking an injury as quickly as possible acutely with physical therapy increases your recovery in, in more quickly. So I'm glad to see that. Yeah. Not only do I work for a therapy company, <laughs> since you were inpatient, so it really doesn't right. do us financially, but um, I'm glad to see that because we know that as a company, how therapy helps people. Um, I think we see FCEs go in cycles. Like there used to be a time we did FCEs on everybody before they released to full duty. Um, but then again, you know, the flip side is if it's invalid, most of the doctors aren't on diastasis. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think you see that coming and going. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to see as a bigger problem moving forward because of the way America is at this time, more co comorbidities. Sorry, I just want to stumble on that word. <laughs> it is a weird word. <laughs> um, needs to be addressed through the treatment plan. Maybe it's not something workers comp owes for, but it does impact our recovery. And I wish some of the worker comp, workers comp doctors would dig into that a little bit more. So somebody who has diabetes is not going to recover as quickly as somebody that doesn't have diabetes. Right. Yeah. And, and of course that impacts the cost of my claim, but it's something that we need to make sure that we're addressing and handling as we're going through that process with that employee, yeah. because it's what's best for them in the end. Um, you know, the person is a whole person. Now, grant you, there's some states it doesn't matter. It's an eggshell plaintiff. Um, you get them as you find them, kind of. So, um, you know, it is what it is. But um, I think those, um, you know, one of the other things I find frustrating that people seem to go through is um, whether or not we're going to follow different guidelines. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier, and I hate to go backwards, is fee schedules. Some of the states don't have fee schedules. New Jersey. New Jersey's money. New Jersey's money. <laughs> Good old New Jersey. And then, you know, then you have the variations in how they're handled in each state. I'm not saying we need to be uniform because I know that means the federal government's getting involved and everybody will be upset about that. Yeah. But um, it would be nice to see some fee schedule across the board because this does ultimately impact the bottom line of the company. Um I don't, I'm not saying we need to be as cheap as Medicare, but <laughs> <laughs> we've actually, we've, I've seen in New Jersey, um, well, let's say I have a, a claim in New York that I'm handling and New York is a fee schedule state. So I've, I've seen doctors in New York actually um, operate on patients in New Jersey at a surgical center and then try and bill per the no fee schedule, the reasonableness, you know, standard in New Jersey. But meanwhile, how, as, as a carrier, you can't really plan for that because you're planning for a New York risk. You're planning for a New York risk with New York fee schedules and treatment that you can anticipate and plan for that. If you have a doctor now going outside of the state to treat, it, that kind of all goes up in smoke. Yeah. Um, so that's like one thing. I, and, and that's actually been litigated and, and it's been held that you can't do that. It's, you know, but doctors get tricky with the fee schedules. They try and work around them. I would try having somebody live in Florida and move to somewhere like New Jersey. Oh, where, where, yeah. Where the, where the fee schedule is supposed to apply. Right. And it, it is difficult. I mean, it's not it's not the employee's fault they want to move to another state, but trying to get to sure. have fee schedule going to a different, like I had somebody move to Alaska. Um, <laughs> and Alaska doesn't have a fee schedule either, but 
everything costs more in Alaska. So that was like, yeah. uh, wow. Are, are you seeing any, or, or what do you see as some like hot topics in the comp world, or at least in your comp world right now? So right now, I hate to say it, COVID. Yeah. 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 I mean, some of the states. I hate to say it because we're so sick of saying it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly why I said it. We're so sick of saying it. Yeah. Um, nursing shortages, which yeah. impacts return to work because you can't get them in to see the doctor timely. Um, we're also having return to work issues. We've had return to work issues since COVID because people were scared of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we had several workers comp who didn't want to come back because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I think t- the pandemic changed so many people and how they view things mm-hmm. that it impacted not only our, our employment problems of hiring people, but also bringing people back to work. So yeah. um, return to work is taking on a new, new evil head thanks to the pandemic. <laughs> um, would, um, are, are you seeing a lot of states um, paying for uh, medical marijuana through workers comp because I know in New Jersey you can be reimbursed for medical marijuana but what is the consensus and like I feel like you're a good person to ask because you know all the states <laughs> um, like where are you seeing a change in other states too sort of leaning towards using that for treatment where you are seeing it a lot I have not knocked on wood seen it come up in my cases personally okay but like you know the first case that I really remember hitting was New Mexico so New Mexico's one um obviously it's a huge discussion in Colorado because it's legal all the way around there um California is the same so although I think it is becoming a trend I think though you're starting to see some of the states push back and say it's federally illegal how can you ask a company who reports to the federal government meaning all the financials for an insurance company have to be approved by the federal government because most of the insurance companies are rated and are t- right. uh, traded on the stock exchange. So they're having some federal accountability somewhere in their pipeline, ask them to pay for something that's federally illegal. Yeah. So I think we are seeing more of it. And every conference I go to, it's always talked about. Um, kind of like COVID, it's probably over talked about. Um, but it's interesting. There was a recent case that just came out that, and I'm trying to remember what state it was, where the judges just said, it's illegal federally. How can you make a company pay for something that's federally illegal, even if it's legal in your state? Right. Um, right. And so um, I know Florida says that they can write them a prescription. They can write them a prescription for medical marijuana, but workers' comp's not paying for it. So you can have it prescribed under your workers' comp claim, but we're not paying for it. Interesting. Well, it's interesting too, is if you think about it big picture, you go to settle a case, you have to do a Medicare set aside. Mm-hmm. And oh, Medicare right. is not going to be part of it, even if it's part right. of the regiment. So then they're going to ask you to put money because like there's some drugs that, that Medicare doesn't cover either that you have to set aside in your Medicare set aside. Well, right. Say, what? Um, <laughs> so with that being said, so then you have to figure out how do you reimburse that? And do you actually yeah. acknowledge that you're reimbursing them for that? So yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum for sure. Yeah. It puts everyone in sort of a weird situation trying to do yes. everything right within the guidelines, you know, within the law, but there's just, there's no way it seems. Well, and I've heard a lot about too, with the, another like trending impact on comp is the, the rise of the televisits um, and, you know, how doctors can't get a really good assess with the telehealth doctors can't get a good assessment. However, uh, to on to the con or the flip side, like the physical therapy televisits seem to work okay, but the just the update, like the revisiting with the doctor and trying to check your current condition televisits, you know, there's there's a negative impact to that on the, on the comp world because this doctor can't. I mean, and in GL, I see it too. If the doctor can't actually look at the patient, like how do they really know if their back is right. better? Um, so I'm play devil's advocate. I, I, I'm 50-50 on the telemedicine for a couple of different reasons. Number one, when I send somebody to a brick and mortar clinic, sometimes they're gone for two or three hours. I'm here to take care of patients. So, you know, if someone said telemedicine world, I'm all for it. But I think it's like a lot of other things in life. We need some parameters and expectations around it. So I've worked very closely with the company that's been doing our telemedicine about what I think we should be looking for, how quickly we should be sending it out you know, those kind of things. Um, I think there's a benefit to some people there. 
Um, but to be honest, when you talk about somebody coming in and tell what their back pain is, they're going to tell them it's an eight out of 10 in person. They're going to tell them an eight out of 10 on a, on a, yeah. So I don't know that that changes a whole lot. Um, I like the idea just because it's convenient and it's quick. But, you know, I, th I think it has a place. It's just figuring out what that place is. Um, yeah. You want them to have good quality of care. But I've always kind of had a theory since I've been doing comp since I started is after about six to eight weeks, the initial person that they're seeing, if they can't take care of them, it's time to move them to somebody, to, you know, move them to a specialist, yeah. get them the, get them that um, x-rays, the whatever MRIs, whatever they need. Let's figure out what's, let's not be the hindrance to recovery. Yeah. So I feel the same way about telemedicine. And the flip side is, is if you're seeing an orthopedic surgeon and you're just going in for a follow-up to see how therapy's going, it's more like a check-in and yeah. not like a range of motion and all that good jazz. Why not? It's quicker for the doctor. I, I don't know that it's a whole lot cheaper for us, these schedule wise, because they're going to bill us for an office visit. Right. But ultimately, they're depending on where you're at in this country, like it's one of our Boston hospitals, that may mean a half a day for them to go see the doctor just to say, hey, I'm doing better. Right. up your physical therapy script nobody really wants to be in the car that long yeah and it's not necessarily needed you know it's so i mean i think there's a time and place for it and i think it's time that workers can't be a little more evolution we haven't always been we're usually in the 20 we're usually about <laughs> about 20 years behind that's true <laughs> i think it, things are just starting like you're getting to e-file now certain things you know, New York, like we can do conferences virtually despite the pandemic, just always. So you're right. It's like, we're finally catching up to the eight ball in terms of progress, I think, for comp. I mean, are like states that we're still sending in paper forms before 2020? I mean, yeah. just saying. <laughs> right, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> you know, 2020 made workers comp evolve. It's not yes. one of the strong areas, but we're evolving. That's yeah. true. It's not exactly. made workers comp and the DMV suddenly <laughs> take some st steps forward like oh you no longer need to come in to get your license in fact right <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> thank you COVID uh. I, think, I think the doctors honestly because like my my PCP he still writes down medical notes when I come in to see him so he's even got to where he go hey you want to just do your do your visit virtually next time yeah I mean, if it's not my yearly physical, as far as like your blood work and all that good jazz, why not? Right, exactly. So I think there's a time and place for everything. And I think yeah. it's just trying to figure out what that niche is to get that best outcome you're talking about, Megan. Yeah. Um, so one thing I I'm thinking of this, since you, you are in so many different jurisdictions and you deal with, you know, council all over the country, um, you know, are there any things that you notice on your end from outside counsel that they do that are good and bad um like some things you're like oh I love it when my attorney does this and others and like if they if I get another attorney <laughs> does this I'm gonna like throw my computer across the, the table mm -hmm. <laughs> um I, when I meet an attorney and give them a chance I meet them and tell them that I'm unapologetically high maintenance and um <laughs> And I'm going to tell you how I want you to write your letters. I'm not telling you what I want in your letters. I'm going to tell you how to write your letters. I want this information. I want it in work because I don't want to have to hijack some. I want to rob and duplicate some of your information. And I need you to spell out all the calculations, every last bit of them, even if it's a statute thing, because in California, it's a statute that they use right. quote in order to get your calculation out. Because when we go to explain it to other people, they pull out a calculator and do the math. So that's important that I know how you got to your math because my boss yeah. is going to pull out the math and he's going to do his, he's going to pull out his calculator and he's going to do the math every time. Right, right. Um, I like attorneys who keep me involved. I don't like attorneys who send me a letter when they could have just sent me an email. And I understand <laughs> they can bill more for that, but I am more apt to get you whatever you need if you send me an email and instead of me having to open a letter that I'm like, is that a long letter or a short letter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I ask all people that if I can reply to you like that, I will reply to you like that and be done with it. So I can move on to the next yes. one. Yes. If it's a letter, I'm like, oh, signing up for something here. So I have <laughs> the attorneys who will write me a letter to tell me like, hey, the judge adjourned us for two, first two more cycles. Like you could have right. right, right, right. I mean, yeah. And I think sometimes the letter thing I think is like, it's like an old school mentality 
type thinking or it's so I think a lot of it's how how attorneys were trained or or like one how long they've been practicing but how who they were trained by and if they were trained by someone who always did something in letters I think like I, we definitely have some colleagues who who like the letter like they definitely do and I think a lot of it is about just knowing the client what is the client like not so right. much what you like but I do think that that it's something that was just I think back in the day letters were how things were communicated and so it's like that official old like lawyer we get tell me CY. and i was like yeah but can't you do that and then you well know. you can <laughs> <laughs> and i was like apparently you got burned at the stake one time and i, I did yeah. that that happens uh, trust me it's happened to all of us in one form or another just saying yep. you haven't been working in corporate America ever and not been burned at stake for something you yep. didn't document that you did or you didn't do what you were supposed to do or whatever. Or so maybe like I told you and you're like, and then, oh yeah, now they can prove it. Right. But I don't know that sending me a, a paragraph letter to confirm our conversation that said you're right. going to call the doctor's office and set a conference is. Yeah. Right. Again, right. Then. And I think one of the things I'll say is everybody is different and not like, I don't care if I met everybody in your firm, doesn't mean that somebody's going to gel with me. And it doesn't mean that there won't be three people that would gel with me. But I do know that I'm a little more high maintenance than some people and some people like working for me and some people don't. Um, but like the, I have two gentlemen that work for me and like they have different styles Mm -hmm. And they have different needs and expectations from their attorneys. So like one time, one of the attorneys did something, I said, that attorney wouldn't work for me. And, and they started, and, and the guy that worked for me started laughing and, and they were like, yeah, that's not really Susie's style. But that, I think that's part of this is like, yeah. we were talking earlier about competition and that's probably why it happens is you gel with some people and you don't with others. And it's all about your mindset. And I think understanding what that client wants, like, I'm not going to, I don't want to deny every claim. I don't want to call you and say, should I accept or deny? And you go deny, deny, deny. I'm not a deny the person. I want, I want to pay for what I owe. Right. Um, and you know, there's sometimes I, one of my least favorite sayings is shut up and write the check. But there's times that you're going to have to say, Susie, it's time to put down the, the boxing gloves. Cause that's one of my favorite sayings. I need to own boxing gloves. Um, mm. There's times to say it's time to put down the boxing gloves. It's not going to get any better than this. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a win. And then there's a lose and there's a, this is a win, but it's unhappy. Yeah. 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 So, you know, there's, you know, this is our best day in court. This is like your dream come true. This is probably where you're going to end up. And this yeah. is, this is worst case scenario. So sometimes it's time to say, this is it. And yeah. so I think that's part of it. That's one of the things I think is important to me as I'm meeting attorneys um, because I am in so many states I need people to, to take, be patient with me. I'm going to ask you questions. I remember the first time, Melissa, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, first time I ever met a New Jersey attorney, I was like, can't you do X, Y, Z? And he was like, no, we don't do that here. And I said, can't you do X? He's like, no, we can't do that here. Either. Like, what can we do in New Jersey? Because nothing. The box. <laughs> You're killing me over here, Smalls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes it's being willing to take the pushback from somebody who's not been there, but has these other states tactics in their mind and trying to help them understand. And so some attorneys just don't have patience for that. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that want to understand because I've been doing it for so long. It helps me to understand, but also when I have to go back and explain it to someone to, you know, the CEO of the hospital, cause I'm spending their money or my boss or my two up boss. I need to understand. And it's much easier if you help me understand, because I look at the money when we spend it to settle a claim, like it's my money, like you're taking money out of my son's mouth to eat. So right. help me understand why, like I had a call today, but actually a New Jersey case. Um, she's got a lot of pre-existing conditions. And I was like, but my injury was so minor. And he was like, yeah, but she's already over the hump because of all of her pre-existing stuff. And I was yeah. like, Oh, this is going to be fun to explain. Well, the good thing about New Jersey, just in general, because I feel like we're um, smack talking New Jersey a little bit. And I am a New, Jer I'm a New Jersey girl. All right, Jersey <laughs> so, girl. Go for it. Uh, so, um, no, the one thing good about New Jersey comp. Um, the one thing. On, the one thing. 
The singular <laughs> thing about New Jersey comp that's good uh, is that you get a credit. Like yeah. in New York, you don't really you don't get a credit for pre existing. It's just you kind of have to factor it in. But New Jersey, at least you 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 it'll like take money off the bottom line, which is yeah, good. your bill of credit, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, we were talking about my bill of credit, and so right. but he was like, "You're over the hump." So yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Nothing you can do. The credit is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I <appreciate laughs> right. I appreciate you recognizing it. Yeah, it yeah. Didn't really hump. help you. <laughs> <laughs> didn't help you. Didn't mean to smack New Jersey. No, it's okay. We get it all the time. We're used oh, to man. it. We're used um, to it. Yeah, the attorney I was talking to today said that he was like, "Yeah, everybody I talk to tells me New Jersey is their worst, their, one of their least favorite states." Um, yeah, but at least you could control the medical in New Jersey. The employer can control the medical. I appreciate that. Yes, I, and it. I appreciate the fact there are doctors that want to do comp in New Jersey because right. right. there's some states like or certain areas of some states because we have some hospitals in some areas that don't have a whole lot of doctor choices. Yeah. And like in Florida, I can only send them in a certain radius. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're stuck with who's in the area and some of them don't want to do comp, but they take comp. So yeah. at least in New Jersey, there's a, a good variety of doctors that are willing to do workers comp. Right. And that's okay, true. That's, that's part of the hurdle in the States that you can do, that you can direct care is finding doctors that are willing to deal with workers comp. And when I say with that, like in Florida, they have to fill out the DWC 25. Um, in other states, we all, we send them with a form to fill out so we'll understand their capabilities. And so if the doctor's not willing to fill that out so I can figure out what I can have the employee, what tasks they can do within their job restrictions, you know, it's not a big help to me. I'm glad yeah. you're willing to treat them, and I'm sure you're a great doctor, but <laughs> you can't help me right. get back to work and help them get their regular pay, you know. It's not it, super helpful. It's yeah. like there's like a, a another, it's a couple extra steps I think that doctor's offices have to do if they're going to treat workers' comp patients. So I guess I could see why some doctors may, you know, not want to deal with it. But um, you're right. At least in Jersey, there's like a good amount to choose from. There's a good pool to choose from. Yeah. And that's, I'm appreciative of that. You run into problems in some states like Alabama, it's a panel state. So if you have a, somebody, like in Birmingham, if you have somebody's not happy with their occupational medicine doctor and they want their panel option, it's really hard to find four unrelated physicians in the occupational medicine category in the city of Birmingham. Right, right. So what do you do? Uh, get creative. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Luckily, that doesn't happen all that often. Right. Yeah. right. Too. I would be like, hey, man, that's like your ace. Why don't you sit on your ace and yeah. <laughs> you can refer you to a specialist and then we'll go from there. There you go. But still, you know, I, I know you got the other states have had this problem. I don't know if you guys seen this in your jurisdictions or not, but like a lot of practices have started mixing. And so then when that you go, needed two physicians, the unlike physicians, you're like, okay, well, that practice just merged. So there went two of my doctors. Mm. And you hope one oh, of the doctors that you have right. is not in that practice. So you're like, oh, right. this is really messing with my mojo here. Yeah. yeah. And what can you uh, do at that point? Hit the road, Jack, I guess. <laughs> hit the road, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, start paying for transportation to right, like, right, right. You know, to where they have to be. And you hope that the injured worker is willing to do that. Right. Um, I think that's where the creativity comes in. Okay, well, uh, we'll pay for the transportation. Uh, right. You know, you do all you can. I mean, you're at least at least the employee, and that's this is kind of what I'm I'm getting from you, which is really awesome to see. Is that like you're going to do what you need to do to make sure that your employee gets treated, and and you don't always see that, unfortunately. You know, sometimes it's a little more adversarial than that between the employee employer and the employee. When you come when it comes to a comp claim, but yeah. it doesn't seem like it's it's like that with, with your company. You know, rather it's more like you said. It's just we want to get you better. Yes, and that's really the culture me and my team are pushing. Um, yeah, because we have an expectation for our employees to take good care of our patients. We should do the same for our employees. Right, yeah. right. And that's what I want. And I mean, you know, it, it's. Unfortunately, I always tell uh, when we do our HR director training, we always say communication day one communication will make or break a worker's comp claim. Right. And if you don't have an open communication with that employee, 
they will ask their aunt's uncle's next door neighbor who's had a, a worker's comp claim and you'll, they'll hear all about how it went. And, <laughs> right. You know, and they have how much money they got. Out. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what you don't want them to do. And, you know, the story by the time they asked or, oh, I heard such and such, such and such had a worker's comp claim and da, 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 da. I don't want that. And that's one of the things that we've worked very hard with Corbell to do. We want excellent customer service out of the box for our employees because what we know is true is if we communicate and try to alleviate that anxiety that comes with having a worker's comp claim or God help us, worker's comp does not have a positive (laughs) connotation to it. If we can try to address that on the front end, the outcomes for us will be better on the back end. Yeah. So if we're, we're hoping to attack it from both sides, if that makes sense, our HR directors use the front line, educating them and trying to be that and try. And like I tell them, if you don't know what to do, call me or call somebody on my team. We'll help you. We'll coach you through it. If we don't know the answer, we will find somebody between the adjuster, their supervisor, the claims director, one of our attorneys, we will find the answer. We will come up with a solution. All right. Um, I don't have a problem calling a doctor's office and authorizing something or providing bill payment information, yeah. you know, those kind of things. And as we've learned things over the years, we've tried to implement new ideas like direct deposit, you know, let's push that out. Right. You know, the, the old school mentality of they have to come in and get their paycheck or they have to go to the mailbox and get their check out. Yeah. That's really old school. That's so, yeah. that's so 1970s. <laughs> right. <laughs> None of us get our check. Like no one gets it that way. And I'm right. sorry, I, I just started chuckling because I think it's the second time I've seen is your dog jumping off of something. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's my doodle. He, he knows I it, but, no, I just, I would, I would just laugh because at first I was like, was that a cat? No, it's way too loud to be a cat. <laughs> Cats have much softer landings. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry about that. Don't, don't apologize. apologize. It can be a distraction. And that's why I blurred out my screen because occasionally he'll lean in. And, and if I use one of my work backgrounds, like you'll see like our gym and then you'll see his head come through the gym. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I like love it, but you didn't even flinch. So it just must happen a no. hundred times a day to you. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't even yeah. think about it. And I just, I've laughed both times and I'm like, oh man. <laughs> Well, it's not a hundred times a day and I don't only work from home one day a week. So oh. it doesn't happen all the time. And when I worked from home all the time, we didn't have him. He's only, he's only a year old. Aww. Aww. I guess he's a year and a half now. Can't so, blame him. And so he does it some, like when he starts getting antsy. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And like he heard like the FedEx guy go by. So I think he's thinking, Ooh, investigate. Will-. Yep. So he's, he's getting anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, that was, was actually a good segue because we're just about out of time and, but I, I did want to end without, without asking you this. Now, looking back on, you know, your career and, and the progress you've made, is there any advice that you would give your younger self? Yes. Find somebody and make them be your mentor. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. think it like, There's a huge movement in a lot of areas across the world, but in workers comp too, about women helping other women. There's the women in work comp group. And they've talked about a lot of these things. Um, I had a really good manager when I was working at Allegasco. That was my first six years. And I had another girl that was really good for me. They weren't in the industry and we didn't talk about my future plan and my future growth. I wish as like my twenties and early thirties, somebody would have talked to me about those kind of things. Um, so looking back, at, Hey, go find somebody that could help pull you up the ranks and teach yeah. you what you need to know. And help great you think, hey, where do you want to go? And right. So I've always had that coachable, teachable spirit. So, you know, I, yeah. I would teach anybody anything. And my joke is, <laughs> the guy that works for me, he said, I want your job one day. And I said, great, bring it. Because <laughs> I need to teach you. And I need to make sure I stay on my A game. So it's good yep. for both of us. Yeah, that's great. I want you, I said, I want you to be ready for the next step. But also the flip side is I, it keeps me sharp too. And yeah. I iron sharpens iron. Yeah, and That's, that's great from, advice for everyone. Oh, I'm sorry, Meg. I was going to say, it keeps you from being complacent. Like, right. you, know, you know, you can't get too comfortable and be like, oh, this, is how, this is how I do it. This is how it goes. You know, you, you, you keep having to like push yourself. Yeah. And there's so much out there and there's so many different ways you could take an an avenue and workers comp on this side of the fence that I think 
real, I didn't, I don't think I realized how many facets of workers comp there was when I got into this so many years ago. Um, looking back now, you know, you have the managed care side. So you're talking about the networks and all that kind of stuff. Then there's case management. I'm not saying I'd do it any differently, but there's things that you could do to cr- segue, crossover, not be complacent and continue to learn and grow. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that is very good advice. And, and I think I also like the point about find, like find your mentor, not have your mentor find you like, fi- you know, it's, right. it's important to, to be like, you know, kind of be like, I want to be like that person. Now, sometimes that person might not want a mentee. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's very true. And but, you, as, as I'm getting older and I'm raising this generation, if you will, because my son's 22, I'm now raising my nephew that's 17 at college now. And I've got a 14 year old nephew and a 12 year old niece things really are different than the way we grew up or the way I grew up. I won't say we, I don't know you, you ladies age, but the way I grew up. Um, so realizing that their mindset and their exposure to things is much different than ours ever was. Yeah. So realizing finding somebody coming fresh out of college to kind of show the ropes to teach them about things Because corporate America is corporate America, but there's still things that we can teach them in corporate America to kind of keep that, I don't want to say the dog eat dog world thing, but showing them how you work with people and how you network and those kind of things. Because initially I didn't understand how important networking was. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that, that kids, they do it unintentionally through Snapchat, Instagram, maybe LinkedIn, but realizing going out and meeting people face to face, going to these conferences and learning to talk and, you know, have candid conversations about your claims and what worked for you is good for kids coming out of college. We had yeah. um, an intern this summer from UGA and she was a sponge. She wanted to learn any and everything she could. And she sat in on a claims review with me and you would have thought I taught her how to make her rich. She was so <laughs> excited to learn. And so finding people who are like that, I think yeah. is, is gold. And those are the people that you want to try to, that you see potential in that you want to put into you. Yeah. I think that's such a good point. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you always want the person who wants to be there and wants to learn more and not be like, Oh, I'm good. I know I, I learned enough. and we have a couple guys we have a data analytics team and so workers comp data is much different than the other data that we have and so I spend a lot of time trying to explain the data and the importance of the data and how we how I look at the data and how I use it and they'll bring me something I said that's not right and I'll tell them how I know it's not right and I'll go go back and try and look for this or that or the other and I that's important to be willing to be coachable and be able to teach them and take the time because I've been doing it 23 years. I can almost do it with my eyes closed when I'm talking about the data piece. Mm -hmm. Um, So being open-minded and willing to teach them. And I'm okay. I'm one of those people probably I grew up much different. I'm okay with saying, I'm sorry. And I'm okay saying I messed up or I just don't understand. Let me find somebody that can. Yeah. And so let me connect the dots because if it's a learning opportunity for me, it's a learning opportunity for my team as well. So if I don't know the answer, let's all get together with some, whoever has the answer. In this case, it was Corvell's bill review team. Let's get them together. Let's have them explain it to us. Help, let them help us understand. Yeah. And, and that's just, I think that it's so important. Like even like for like Melissa and I, as you know, in our role, like you, you have to be willing to admit you don't know what it is and either find someone who does or do the work and the research to figure it out. Um, because I, I think I've said this before, the most dangerous person in the room is the one who thinks they know everything. Right. <laughs> and like, I'm one of those people that that's one of the things I love about going to conferences. You meet people like I met a, another company that's very large like us. And then she said, she goes, this is the first time I've ever been to these conferences. And I started telling her some stuff. She was like, oh, that's so great. And I was like, call me if you ever need anything. If you're on the road and going to a conference, holler at me. Because I remember the first time I did national comp, comp conference by myself. Lord, that was so scary. But I met some wonderful people, learned a lot of valuable information. And so the networking was well worth it. Yeah. 
Well, Susie, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to come on. It was a pleasure sitting down and chatting with you. We probably could have gone on for much, much longer. Unfortunately, I'm the one with the hard stop today. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to enforce my own my own rule. <laughs> but for our, our listeners out there, as always, if you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to the Defense Never Rest on Apple Podcasts. And you can also find us at YouTube at TBNR Podcast. And I thank you for tuning in.